we're continuing our discussion of speech from within the Canadian psychoanalysis and I'm going to set you a task right at the beginning of this talk. If what we've been saying about live speech and the possibility of speech being disrupted or my speech disrupting my ego to be more accurate is true, then there's very possibly <laughs> a chance that I will have just such a, uh, a speech uh, moment in what follows. So see if you can be a good Lucanian and see if I make any mistakes. It's presumably not going to be that hard to find one, but we're going to train yourself on trying to do exactly that. So we have been thinking about what I've been calling live speech. And the reason we're doing that is, is to try and get a sense of how we might progressively get a, a, a notion of what full speech might be. And the more we make that step towards thinking about full speech as opposed to what Heidegger would call the idle chatter of something akin to empty speech, the more we're also going to try to appreciate how full speech is actually not so much an encapsulation of a truth or a, a, a fully emergent statement as such, but it's more about the disruptions, the swerves, the, the unintended emergence within speech of something that hadn't, that doesn't serve the ego. So just to make that point. But another agenda we have here also is to try to get a better understanding of what the Lacanian unconscious will be or is and one of the conclusions that I will draw at the end of this short little mini lecture is to say that the site of the unconscious for Lacan is exactly the site of language and particularly in this instance, the site of speech. So let's then draw to our focus. I want you to think a little bit about um, this statement. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Now, of course, uh, for many of you, immediately the resonance is to think about uh, former president, American president Bill Clinton, in this statement, which is clearly a, a falsity that he makes in the hope that he will um, be able to escape from the legal ramifications of some of what he had done. It's a great statement to, to consider. We could think of many others, actually. Presumably, there's a whole series of similar kinds of statements that uh, politicians have made, which are patently false, but they're using it to, to try to get themselves, so to speak, off the hook. It's a joke. Um, hook. Um, so we're going to think a little bit about that statement today. <clears throat> the way we're going to do that, though, is we're also going to contextualize it in terms of the general theme of... Uh, unintended consequences or unintended implications of statements. And to do that, I'm going to refer back to Six Moments in Lacan, my book, and as a way of introducing how we're going to think in Lacanian terms about this, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I need to just do a little bit of uh, introduction. And the way that I want to do that is to talk about discursive psychology. So I've got some colleagues and of course I've, I've actually also done some work in the area of critical psychology or discursive psychology. And one colleague, uh, Mick Billig, has this book called Freudian Repression. And he takes aim at a whole series of notions within the idea of Freud's uh, concept of repression. And what Billig is trying to do or one part of what he's trying to do is to say that repression isn't something that we need to see within the kind of intrapsychic dynamics of uh, intra-psychological processes. Rather, he wants to make the argument that repression is happening in, in social domains of interacted speech, right? So he's very influenced by the notion of a discourse, by the idea that we're socially constructing meaning at all times, and that repression doesn't again happen in a kind of internalized psychical way, but that it's a joint production of speakers. So what initially sounds like a very kind of critical engagement with psychoanalysis, and let's also bear in mind that Mick Billig is someone who's highly critical of Lacanian psychoanalysis, does not like Lacan at all. In fact, is a very forceful, uh, critical engagement with Lacan's idea of the mirror stage. But I think what's somewhat ironic about discursive psychology taking up a critical, a critical position 
of Freudian notions of repression is that, funnily enough, a large part of what they say fits very well with Lacanian conceptualizations of repression and Lacanian conceptualizations of how language and spoken verbal utterances are themselves uh, implicated and utilizing a whole series of operations of language, which are for Lacan the operations of the unconscious itself. So to reiterate, even though some of these arguments within discursive psychology about how repression works within a societal, social, joint, enacted domain seem to be explicitly anti-psychoanalytic, they're actually doing a very good job, I think, of highlighting certain facets of a Lacanian understanding of how language and speech performances are still operating within a kind of understanding of the unconscious. So here I'm turning to my book and I'm citing a, another colleague called Kevin Darheim. And this is what I note. I'll, I'll give my introduction and then I'll give a little speech. Proponents of discursive psychology emphasize that it's quite possible for an audience to hear in a given expression something quite different from what the speaker had intended. This is uh, Kevin Durheim's uh, comment. This possibility of unintended hearings arises for the dual reason that all expressions leave something's unsaid and what is said can be understood in more than one way. Expressions do not exhaust the possibility of their meaning. Expressions do not exhaust the possibility of their meaning. Expressions do not exhaust uh, the possibility of their meaning. All right, so that's not said with any reference to Lacanian psychoanalysis, but I think it's such an interesting and fruitful way to, to, to think about some of what we've been saying in terms of the live possibilities of speech and speech being disruptive of the ego. So I want to draw on that and make a couple of comments here. This is the theoretical work that we need to get out of the way before we approach uh, Bill Clinton's statement. We can say then, being inspired by what our discursive psychology colleagues have said, that every statement brings in its wake a series of grammatical variations. Every statement brings in its wake a series of grammatical variations. Now, the way of putting that is when we hear, when we are attentive to what is being spoken, we do not attend merely to simply the delimited material of the actual statement of the words. If we're, being able to, if we're going to be able to follow the meanings of what someone is saying and be able to anticipate where they might go, we don't just hear and we don't just attend to the minimal constituent elements of what they've actually said. We're able to bear in mind a broader framework of meanings, of potential variations, of potential implications in what they're saying. Every statement then exists within a horizon of associated yet different formulations. So I'm going to just quote um, a section from my book. Every utterance exists within a horizon of associated yet differing formulations. What is conveyed in a communicative exchange is not merely a minimal stripped to the core message, but also a number of subsidiary perspective significations. You could say that this is what alerts us to an imperative, a directive, if one is going to be a kind of Lacanian practitioner, Lacanian psychoanalysis. What would that imperative be? It would be to try to facilitate a series of lateral significations. And that attempt, remember my discussion before of finding the tributaries of meaning, being aware of, of switch words, um, that attempt to hear, to explore a series of lateral significations, not just following what the person is trying to say or intends to say or hopes to express, but to pick out the possibilities of sideways, or as I put it here, lateral significations, that may actually take priority over the aim of extracting a singular meaning. Let's reiterate that. Let's recapitulate. Any communicative statement conveys along with it a matrix of alternative hearings. And of course, I'm referring back to that nice quote by uh, Kevin Durham when he speaks about the possibility of unintended hearings. In a kind of way, you could say that the analyst's role is to be attentive to what some of those unintended hearings might have been. Continuing, any communicative statement conveys along with it a matrix of alternative hearings. You could say then that there's a framework of intelligibility that accompanies any statement. A framework of intelligibility that accompanies any statement and along with it, a framework which supports multiple grammatical 
permutations of such a statement. Now that may sound a little bit abstract. That may sound a little bit abstract, but in a sense, let's think about this for a while. If we use language, if we have an implicit understanding of grammar, then what I hear when you speak is not just the bare minimum of the message you're trying to convey. I also have that framework of a grammatical understanding of what you're saying. And if I have that framework of a grammatical understanding, then you could say that I have the framework which enables me to understand multiple grammatical permutations of what you are saying. Okay, let's see if we can make that a little bit more straightforward by referring to this statement. Bill Clinton says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <clears throat> now, we can be a little bit playful here. We could say, as in, in, to, to get a grasp on what I'm trying to convey here, imagine that you are, <laughs> as it were, Bill Clinton's analyst. And he makes the statement, I did not have sexual relations with that woman while he's on the couch when you're his analyst. Now, we've previously said in these lectures that it's important to attend to the signifiers, to say and to hear what, to attend to what the person is conveying, not what one thinks they're saying. So this may sound like a bit of a contradiction, but by the same token, we're also trying to, to see, to play out, to facilitate some of the unintended implications of what one is saying. So, imagine that you, the analyst, Clinton says, I do not have sexual relations with that woman. Now, we already know that for Freud to make an assertion in analysis, that's not my mother. Okay, it's not your mother. Uh, I, I'm reminded of someone saying, oh, I had a very little, little fight the other day. Little fight? Without adding meaning or without trying to... Uh, project one's own interpretations of it, one could quite viably just ask a question. You did not have sexual relations with that woman? For Freud, the very operation of negation, which is one way that unconscious material can actually have a hearing, can be spoken, is simply to say, no, it wasn't, which enables us to ask, well, could we hear that as it was? So let's think about it. Uh, Clinton's on the couch and says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Maybe one idea, maybe one thing, one tactic you could do as an, an analyst is to say, you did? So you did have sexual relations with that woman? And then you go, no, 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 I did not. Okay, I did not. In other words, you could take exactly his words, maybe edit it, maybe just drop the knot, I did have sexual relations? Which means that one's intervention is not through giving a whole new meaning or not pipe by providing a definitive reinterpretation, but using his words and doing a kind of repunctuation. Or, to put differently the same point, if we have a grammatical framework through which to hear what someone is saying, when someone says, I did not do something, you already have within that framework an ability to, and you implicitly do hear, ah, you did not. Right. So we could play with that statement by simply being aware of Freud's understanding of the role of negation, to put the statement back, throw it back, reflect it back by questioning the not. I did have sexual relations with that woman. There may be many protestations the other way, but from Clinton himself, if he's on the couch, but that's your job as the analyst is to open up some other channels, which are, as it were, actually implicitly present in what he is formulating, even if he's very vociferously saying, I did not. How else could we play with that statement? And you'll get what I'm trying to do here. The mode of one's interpretation is exactly by experimenting grammatically with some of the other implicitly uh, apparent meanings within that. Some of the associative meanings that come with, I did not have sexual relations. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. With that woman? In other words, again, thinking about what is being said, it, you could say that that statement already brings with it in a potential implication that Clinton may not have intended, but which the good analyst might hear or might echo. You did not have sexual relations with that woman. In other words, <laughs> perhaps there were some other woman, and maybe more than one other woman, that you had sexual relationships with. You could also, again, at the level of this utterance, you could also ask the questions, you did not have sexual relations with that woman. You did not have sexual relations with that woman. Did that woman have sexual relations with you? I'm obviously being a little bit playful. It's not necessarily the way that one would pick to formulate or, or, or 
emphasize that point to Clinton himself, but your level of intervention, your level of interpretive intervention is taking what is given with that sentence and asking if we do a little different substitution with the grammar, if we, if we ask about the unintended implication of the sentence. Here's another one. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Dot, dot, dot. But, in other words, the analyst's interpretation would simply be that word, the loaded but, which presumably might imply, but I really wanted to. You could also think about, oh, you did not have sexual relations with that woman. You did not have sexual relations with that woman. But you took a walk on the wild side or you carefully examined. Now, I'm just using these as illustrative suggestions here. I'm not saying that this is something that the analyst should say. But remember, what I'm trying to suggest is that the analyst's level of intervention is at the level of the grammatical permutations of that statement. So we could also do this exercise in a different way. If you were Bill Clinton's unconscious, how else might you have made some of this enunciation? How might you have portrayed it? In other words, you could say the statement, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, could lead to any number of different types of understanding. And we could also ask you, well, instead of sexual relations, maybe, thinking about how the unconscious works, maybe a nice metaphor would have been more appropriate there. I did not play beautiful music with that woman. Okay, a metaphor for sexual relations or walk on the wild side, a metaphor for sexual relations. Or we could say, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. I did not carefully examine that woman. Carefully examine, not just a metaphor now, but another type of substitution a substitution which in linguistic terminology and in Lacanian theory we would call a metonym rather than a metaphor. In other words, it's a substitution on the basis of something very closely aligned to the, the thing of a sexual relationship. So let's try and uh, wrap up. To put, a la to put language into play is to allow for a variety of grammatical substitutions and extensions. By the time the very use of language we are able to do that. The very fact that such a statement would be stated allows you to hear it in a variety of different ways, to play with it in a variety of different ways. That's one way I'm arguing of how to attend to material, to listen to material, and also in a way to intervene within the material. Now, of course, the actual question of, is it saying too much to ask, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, but, as a way of echoing something back to the, the person on the couch. It's going to have an awful lot to do with timing and it's going to have an awful lot to do with other facets of what's going on and the temporality, the sessions and so on and so forth. So this is not a blueprint of how you can intervene as a clinician, but it is, as it were, as it were a set of guidelines for how to think grammatically. It's almost, you could say, how to think about the grammatical unconscious. And I suppose this is the point that I'm trying to make. It's twofold. If we experiment with the various permutations, the associations, the different extensions, the different substitutions one can use in a statement, that for Lacan is exactly how the unconscious works. That's how the unconscious works, on the basis of the linguistic grammar, the linguistic substitutions and extensions that enable us to understand that sentence. That is the unconscious. The unconscious is not something that lies behind language. The unconscious is not this kind of internal well of id impulses and uh, 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 evil, wicked wishes. Rather, the unconscious is apparent at the level of the grammatical substitutions and extensions of a sentence itself. To reiterate that, to put language into play is to allow for a variety of grammatical substitutions and extensions. And I think our conclusion here then is, I've already anticipated it at the beginning of the talk, the site of language for Lacan is the site of the unconscious. We don't need to go behind language. The operation of language is the very operation of the unconscious itself. And what I've tried to illustrate here, in a maybe somewhat humorous way, in a somewhat provocative way, is that that is how one could think about intervening as a kind of editor of the signifiers that the person themselves is using. It's a way of thinking about what else could be unintentionally conveyed by the sentence, by that signification that is being conveyed. And that domain of unintended hearings, possible tributaries, possible associative meanings that are implied in that is precisely one way of thinking about 
the Lacanian way of intervening within, interpreting, and appreciating and attending to speech.